you got your Bibles with you today, turn with me real quickly uh, to Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Luke chapter 19. And this morning we're going to begin looking at another encounter that Jesus had with an individual that totally transformed and radically changed uh, their life. As a matter of fact, uh, this story, this encounter is so uh, famous and well-known and well-loved that when I was growing up in uh, children's church, we used to sing a song. Hey, we used to sing all kinds of good songs in children's church. I was asking my, one of my boys the other day, have y'all sung this song and his banner over me is love? And they, they had never heard them. And so, uh, but when I was growing up in, in children's church, we used to sing a song uh, that comes straight from the passage we're going to be looking at uh, and learning from this morning. And so let me just see if you uh, uh, perhaps learned it like I did. So I'm going to start singing. And if you know it, uh, you just start singing with me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. Isn't that a great song? Man, I love that song. I love that. How many of y'all love that song? Can I see your hands? It's wrong. And, um, uh, we've been singing it for years and years and years. It rhymes and catchy and all those sorts of things. But the song says that he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And that's not quite exactly what Luke says. You're there in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse number one. Notice what, notice what uh, I'm talking about. See if you notice what I'm talking about here today. The Bible says, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Watch this. And he sought to see who Jesus was. But could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is going to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Lord, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Did you catch the difference? Did you catch the distinction? Luke doesn't just say that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He says that he wanted to see who he was. I think that's interesting. I, I think that's really intriguing that after three, three and a half years of the most amazing, sensational, miraculous ministry among the people that Zacchaeus sought to see who Jesus was. That's why I've entitled this morning's message, Curious Faith. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. And I, I think by this time, as you come through the Gospels, everybody in that whole part of the world knew exactly who Jesus was at this point in his ministry, but not Zacchaeus. So the question for me, for me yesterday was, oh, why? Why is that? Why didn't Zacchaeus know who Jesus was? Well, probably because he'd been so busy doing his job as a, a Roman tax collector that uh, he had forgotten he'd been so busy doing his job, uh, charging more than he was supposed to and, and, and stealing from folks and accusing them and putting them in prison and selling their children into slavery and pulling their fingernails out with pliers and all that. I mean, just normal, average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, everyday uh, Roman tax collector stuff uh, that he hadn't had the time to be bothered with this hillbilly from Galilee. And so if it didn't help his bottom line or pad his pockets, he really really wasn't going to waste much time with it. You know, Dr. Rogers used to say about people like Zacchaeus that they get all they can, they can all they get, they sit on the lid and they poison uh, the rest. And that's, that's, that's the way Zacchaeus was. Now, I don't know if you noticed there that Luke doesn't just call him a tax collector. He doesn't just say that he was a tax collector. He actually says that he was a chief tax collector. And there's a whole lot wrapped up in that word. Uh, but it basically means that Zacchaeus was really, really good at doing his bad, bad job. As a matter of fact, Zacchaeus was so good or bad, whichever one uh, you want to use, that Luke says that he was rich. He lived in a big home. He wore the nicest clothes. He ate the best food. Uh, he, uh, uh, he rode in the fanciest chariot. Uh, he very likely had a squad of Roman soldiers to walk with him and protect him uh, wherever it was that he went around town because uh, the Jewish people would have hated him just as much, if not more, uh, than they hated the Romans who were occupying their land. And then one day as he's leaving his tax office, he, he walks out and, and he hears this commotion. He looks down the street and there's a whole bunch of folks that are moving down the street. And some of the folks over on the side, 
outside, they're, they're, they're saying something about Jesus of Nazareth uh, was coming. And, and I don't know what was going on in his life. I don't know what was happening uh, to him personally at this time. But I do know that Zacchaeus was curious about Jesus. He wanted to see who he was and what all the fuss was about. But here's the problem. And Zacchaeus had a big, big, big problem. Zacchaeus's problem was that he was a little man. He was a wee, he was a wee little man. Now, I'm five foot nine. I mean, on the best of days, I'm, I'm five foot nine. And uh, I, I don't know that I'm always self-conscious about that, but when I stand next to John Sansom or some of the other guys around here that are over, I mean, John violates our height requirement here at Abilene and has ever since he came, and I don't see it getting any better. And, uh, and so whenever I stand next to somebody like John or uh, you other guys around here that are six foot two, six foot three, uh, man, I, I get the impression, man, I must be on the short side. And so can you imagine how good I felt this week uh, as I was studying on the CDC, uh, and I discovered that the average height of the American male is, guess what? Five nine. It's your taller one. Y'all the freaks. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I mean, I've never been so glad to be average in my life. And so I read that the other day that five foot nine is the average height of the American male. And so, but Zacchaeus wasn't even average or normal. Zacchaeus, Luke says that he couldn't see Jesus because, quote, he was short of stature. And so, I mean, I can just see him now. He's, he's jumping up trying to see. And there, there's, there's some big haired woman in front of it's all, For short people like me, it's always some big haired woman sitting in front of you in church. You're trying to look around her. And uh, I'm glad when the style's change. And he's trying to look around them and look under their elbows and all kind of stuff. He's climbing up on a a bell of hay. He's standing on a barrel and he still can't see Jesus. And so he looks over to the side and there's a sycamore tree, which are all over that part of Palestine. He shimmies up that, that sycamore tree. He uses his hand to, to shield his eyes from the sun. And he sees all these folks everywhere, men and women and children, little boys and little girls. And they're, they're all talking and laughing and, and shouting and crying. And all of a sudden he hears a voice below him. Look here in verse five. He hears this, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for Today I must stay at your house. And Zacchaeus looks down into the most loving, caring, knowing eyes that he's ever peered into before. And he came down that tree in an instant, just like Jesus told him to. And then the great physician told him that he was about to make another house call that day, and he was going to his house. It's an amazing story. It's a, it's a timely story. It's a relevant story for everybody in this room this morning. And so here's what I want to do this morning, really, really quickly on this last Sunday before school starts back. I want us to see what we can learn about Zacchaeus's curious faith. And if you're taking notes this morning, there, there are only two little points in, in the sermon this morning. And I, I thought I would just tell you this. It's a short sermon because it's about a short man. Uh, and so there are just, they're just, they're just two little points uh, in this morning's sermon. So just jot these down there somewhere. Use your eyeliner, your lipstick, your mascara, pen, pencil, whatever. Use your Zaxby napkin, your, your subway napkin. Be like the young lady out at West. Pull out your iPhone and pull open, the, open up the notes app and take notes there this morning. But there are two little things that I want you to see. First of all, let's look here, first of all, at Zacchaeus's problem. And so again, Zacchaeus had a problem, and his problem was that he was just a normal guy, just an average, ordinary uh, guy. You say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, he is a picture. He, is a, he represents every single person in this room who does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times, those of us in the church will use different words to describe those uh, who don't have a personal relationship uh, with Jesus. And sometimes we'll call them unbelievers. We'll call them unbelievers. But the Bible says that one day, in one way or another, that everybody is going to be a believer. Paul said to the church at Philippi, he said that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You may not be a believer now, but you're going to be a believer someday. And so that may not be the best word. But then we also use the word unchurched. But again, just because you go to church or you're a member of a church doesn't mean that you know Jesus. Again, you can be standing in your garage and you're not a Ford or a Chevy or anything like that. You're not an automobile just because you're standing in the car, in your garage. And just because you're sitting in a church doesn't mean that, that you're a Christian. Sometimes people will use the word pagan. And, uh, but again, uh, there are a lot of people who, who, who we would consider to be pagans, and uh, they live better, more morally upright lives than a lot of the hellions and hypocrites that show up for church every, every single Sunday morning. Uh, there's another word that we use a lot, maybe not quite as much anymore, but the word lost. And that definitely is a good, accurate Bible word, because even the passage that we're looking at this morning says in verse 10 that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so here was Zacchaeus' problem, like many other folks. Uh, he didn't even know that he was lost. I mean, if you would have asked Zacchaeus, hey, are you lost? He'd say, I'm not lost. I know exactly where I'm at. I know what town I'm in. I know where my office is. I know where my house is. I know how to get to the rest. I, I, I'm not lost. And so there are a lot of people today, you would say, you're lost. They'll say, I'm not lost. I know exactly uh, where I am. 
So I've got a pastor friend who refers to people like Zacchaeus who have never begun a personal relationship with Jesus as normal. Because that's where most people are. People without a relationship with Jesus Christ, they're the normal ones. We're the nuts. <laughs> Steve Gaines used to say, you may call me a nut, but at least I'm screwed onto the right bolt. Can I get an amen? And so they're the normal ones. We're the nuts. Before I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and entered into a personal relationship with him, I was just like Zacchaeus. And by the way, so were you. And so there's some problems here. So let's just jot down a few little things. What, what problems did he have and what problems do we have? Well, number one, we don't measure up. Just jot that down. We, we don't measure up. That's, that's the one thing that virtually everybody knows about Zacchaeus. <laughs> he was vertically challenged. He was a wee little man. I, I saw a former church member the other day. She posted on Friday that they were going to buy a pizza and binge watch season two of The Chosen. Anybody been watching the, the, the series on The Chosen? Can I see your hands? Anybody watch The Chosen? I've watched season one. I'm working my way through season two. It's a pretty good series. But you know, they, they messed up. They should have had me be the producer because uh, if I had been the producer, I would have cast uh, Zacchaeus. I would have used somebody like perhaps Danny DeVito if he's still alive or that Peter Dinklage. Uh, I would have cast, because especially Danny DeVito, Danny DeVito was normally uh, playing somebody who's a little on the shorter side and a cookie conniving uh, crook, if you will, character. And so that's the way that Zacchaeus was before he met Jesus on this day. Again, pulling from the, the Chosen series, Zacchaeus was one way, and now he's completely different. And the thing that happened in between was Jesus. I heard about a guy who went to his doctor's office for his annual physical. And he walks in, the nurse said, well, come on in here. Let's just get some, get some stats. And she looks at him. She said, how much do you weigh? He said, 175. And he, she said, all right, step up on the scale. And when he stood up on the scale, it's 200 pounds. And she said, 200 pounds. She said, all right, how, how tall are you? And he said, I'm, I'm a little over six foot tall. And she said, all right, back up against the wall. And she pulled that thing up, put it on his head. And she went, five nine. And then she said, all right, sit down there and put your arm up there. And she said, let's take your blood pressure. And so she's taking his blood pressure. And what about you? Am I the only one I hate that? And... Um, and she went, huh. He said, what? She said, well, that's not normal. He said, what do you expect? I walked in here tall and slender. I'm leaving out of here short and fat. What do you expect? <laughs> well, when it comes to God's standard, every single one of us is like Zacchaeus spiritually. We are we little men and we little women. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's God's standard. You know, maybe you did this. We, we, we stunk at this as, as parents. Our kids are probably too old now to do it. And, uh, but anybody here, when your kids were growing up, you had a spot in your house, maybe it's by the pantry or by the, the side doorway where you would measure them and, and you would mark. Anybody here, can I see your hands? My nanny did that. My, my nanny, my big paw. So when I would go to see them, there was a door frame there as you walked out of their little living room into their little kitchen. And uh, as I would go see them, every time I'd go there, hey, my big pa would say, hey, Brad, get over here. And they'd say, hey, 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 son, uh, come over here. And, and stand up against, I'd stand up against the wall, and my, my, my big Paul would pull out his carpenter's pencil from behind his ear, and he would mark it there, and he'd, he'd put my initial, and he'd put the date on there and to mark how we, how we had grown. Here's what I need you to understand this morning. On God's door frame of righteousness, none of us measures up. There's my mark, there's your mark, there's Adrian Rogers' mark, there's Billy Graham's mark, and then there's Jesus' mark that's a million times higher than any and every other person who's ever lived. Amen. We all fall short of God's standard, which is Jesus Christ. His name is higher than any other name. So the very first thing that we learn from Zacchaeus' problem is that none of us measures up. Number two, uh, we see that we're all seeking something. I told you a few moments ago that Zacchaeus was rich. He was really, really, really. And we would say that he was filthy rich, stinking rich. But here's the problem. He wasn't happy. Uh, there was something that was missing in his life. And as you read this story, it's evident that he's a desperate man. He's, he's rich and dignified. But in verse 4, we see him running down a road and climbing a tree just to see who Jesus was. That's what desperate people do. They run. Now, if you're a bleeding heart liberal here today or you're really sensitive, will you just stick your fingers in your ear uh, for just one second while I make this thing? So I told folks for, forever, if you ever see me running, you better run faster than me because that means there's something really big and ugly and mean behind me and I'm out of ammunition. 
because desperate people run. That's what they do. And desperate people climb trees. Now, when I was growing up, I climbed trees. My, my daughter, Laura Kate, she loves to climb trees. I've heard stories about her being at camp. She's there at our house. Uh, her cat gets up a tree. She'll climb a tree, get up there and get it and, and, and all those sorts of things. I don't climb trees anymore. Again, if you, if you see me up a tree, you better shimmy up that thing quickly too because whatever is big and mean and ugly that's about to get me is going to get you or there's a flood coming or something like that because desperate people climb uh, trees. And so Zacchaeus had this hole in his heart that all the riches in this world couldn't fill. He probably didn't even know that it was what he needed. He just knew that he needed something. Pascal said, I think he was borrowing from Augustine, but Blaise Pascal said that there's a God-shaped hole or vacuum in, in every human heart that can only be filled by God himself. And so that's why when Zacchaeus heard that, that Jesus was in, was in town, he hoped that he would have the solution to his problem. Now, he didn't know it yet, but he was actually looking for God. Lena Stokes, Lena Stokes was in, was in my last church, and, and Brother Josh knows her, and uh, Lena was the oldest lady in the church. She was a widow. She lived uh, in a little bitty house just there by the middle school, and uh, she called me one day upset. I mean, really upset. You could hear it in her voice, and, uh, and she said, Pastor, I need you to get over here right now. I didn't know what had happened. Somebody had died, or I didn't know what had happened. Pastor, I need you to get over here right now, and so I went over to her little house, and I walked in that house. And number one, can I just say this? What is it with senior adults in the middle of the summer, 100 degrees outside, and the heat's on? <laughs> and so I walk into our house. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not going to hell, and that's as close as I ever want to get to it. Can I get an amen? And so I'm in there. I'm sweating. I walk in. She said, Pastor, come in here. And she, she pulls me in there to her little kitchen, and, and there's a table there, and there's a stack of, uh, of, of mail. And she just breaks down crying. And she said, I don't know what to do. And I, I didn't know what had happened. And she said, I got a letter. I got a personal letter. And, 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 and they say that they've got to have my help. They need $1,000 to stop the liberals from ruining America. This is like 15 years ago. I wish you'd have sent the $1,000 if that all it took. And, <laughs> and, and, and so, but as she said, they, they, so Jay Sekulow had sent her a personal letter and uh, said he needed her, uh, he had written her, just her, that he needed $1,000 for her uh, to help him uh, defeat the liberals and keep from destroying America. And she's just breaking down. She said, I don't have $1,000, but he wrote a, me a letter, and it's a personal letter, and I, he needs my help. And I, I had to spend 30 minutes telling her, he didn't write it to just you. She said, no, it's got my name on it. I said, Miss Lena, he didn't write it. He didn't even sign it. There's a computer that did all of that, and he didn't just send it to you. He sent it to 14 million other people. Anybody here grow up, and, and, and remember me today, so you get the letters from Publishers Clearinghouse. I remember being a teenager, and I got that letter addressed to Brad Witt. You are a finalist in the whatever it was, million-dollar uh, sweepstakes. And, man, I'm sitting there going, oh, wow. I'm going to win. I'm never going to have to work again. And, uh, and, and by the way, a million dollars again, especially after you pay taxes, you got what, $30 left? <laughs> and so years ago, Tampa, Florida, just outside there, there was the Bushnell Assembly of God, and they got one of those uh, personal letters from the publisher's uh, sweepstakes. And, and, and here's, here's what the letter said. Dear God of Bushnell Assembly, did y'all catch that like I did? So they send me personal letters to my house. Dear Whit, comma, Brad. <laughs> uh, dear God of Bushnell Assembly, God, we've been looking for you. You're a finalist to receive our $11 million sweepstakes. Don't just sit there, God. Return your sweepstakes for him today. The Tampa Tribune entered the pastor of that, of that Assembly of God church, and the pastor, pastor said, I, I don't plan on sending the form in because I figure God has at least $11 million. He doesn't need it. That's a pretty funny story, but... You know, when, when I was reading about that, I, I thought, that little phrase stuck out to me, God, we've been looking for you. And I, I thought to myself, that's the way it is with so many people today. They're looking for something. May, they might think that it's happiness or purpose or, or meaning or money or relationships or better career or something like that, when in reality they're looking for God. So my question for you this morning is this, are you like Zacchaeus? Are you desperately looking for something to fill that emptiness in your heart? You might not even realize what it is that you're looking for, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus is here today, and he can end your search, and he can satisfy your deepest need. Amen. And so there's Zacchaeus' problem. But then number two, there's Jesus' purpose. And we, 
We're all like Zacchaeus. We've been there. Some of us, some of you may still be there searching for God. But here's the good news. While you've been searching for him, he's been searching for you. That's why Jesus came to this world. As a matter of fact, look down there in verse number 10. Uh, the Bible says, Therefore the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came all the way to, from heaven to find and to save uh, Zacchaeus. And by the way, Jesus came all the way from heaven to find and to save you. As you come here to Luke chapter 19, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem where he's going to die on a hill outside of the city for the sins of the world. It's not going to be long now until he's betrayed, arrested, uh, mistreated, beaten, mocked, spit upon, nailed to a cross, hung between two thieves, and crucified. But between Jericho and Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus is going to find and help a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus and a crooked tax collector named Zacchaeus. Why? Because these men were desperately seeking God and he was desperately, deliberately seeking them. And by the way, he's seeking you today too. And so as we begin to wrap it up this morning, I want you to see that the same way that Jesus related to Zacchaeus is the same way that he wants to relate to you. Look in verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. He called him by his name. I used to be better at this than I am now, and we've got a few more people. But I was always taught that the sweetest sound to any human ear is the sound of their own name. I'm going to pick on Mike over here, my buddy Mike, when I first came to Abilene. I told him, I, I talked about him in the early service, or actually out at West. So when I first came to Abilene, about the first month that I came here, every time Mike would introduce himself to me, he would give me a different name. And I thought I was losing my mind. Remember that? I th- he, he had the biggest kick out of it. And finally, after about three or four weeks, I asked somebody, I said, now what's his name? And they, they said, Mike Russell. And so the next time he came up and he gave me some other name, I said, no, it's not. It's Mike Russell, and I know what your name is. And so we, we, our names are important to us, right? Anybody here, you, you, are you like me? Um, you, do, you like, you, do you like going to those meetings where you have to wear a name tag? I hate wearing name tags. I, I, I hate wearing names. So, so for one thing is, <clears throat> my handwriting stinks. I mean, it's chicken scratching. I don't have pretty handwriting like Josh does. Josh has the prettiest little handwriting you have ever. Anybody here gotten a letter? I know some of y'all have. Anybody got a letter from Josh over the last year? Several of y'all. Have y'all got a letter? Isn't it, the, isn't it make you sick? I love him, but that handwriting. And so uh, my name's already messed up anyway. So it's small, it's scratchy, they can't. And so I don't like wearing uh, those name tags. Here's the thing. Zacchaeus had probably been called all sorts of names. Uh, Most of them, by the way, I can't even repeat in this pulpit. But Jesus called him by his name. And Zacchaeus must have been shocked to hear Jesus say his name. How does he know my name? How does he even know who I am? Zacchaeus climbed up in that tree to see who Jesus was. But Jesus already knew who he was. Jesus knew his name for the same reason that he knows your name. He knows everything everybody's name. He's God. He's God. Again, aren't you glad you don't have to wear a name tag for God to know your name? He already knows your name. He said in Isaiah 43 verse 1, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. You may think that you're all alone in this world, that nobody cares for you. Nobody even knows your name. But I want you to know this morning that there is an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God who created you and he knows you by your name. Not only does he know your name, he knows your need, number two. He knows your name and your need. After Jesus called his name, Jesus told him to come down from that tree. And I can just see all the folks at Zach Zacchaeus had mistreated there uh, in that little, that little village. I can just see uh, all those folks that he had cheated and mistreated all those years. And they're, they're seeing Jesus calm down from that tree. And they're th- sitting there thinking to themselves, oh, he's going to get it now. Jesus is going to get him. Jesus, I mean, Jesus, I mean, boy, you're in trouble now, Zacchaeus. Yeah, Jesus is here now. It's kind of like when, you're, when you were growing up, your mom would say, you just wait till your daddy gets home. Oh, Zacchaeus is in trouble now. He's going to get what he deserves. Now, now Jesus would have been right if he had looked at Zacchaeus and said, Zacchaeus, you are a sorry, good-for-nothing, worthless piece of humanity. You need to repent and give all the stuff back, plus penalty and interest that you've taken from these folks. And if you don't, God's going to start raining lightning bolts from heaven and zap you and turn you into a crispy critter. By the way, he was. He was a thief. But here's what I need you to understand this morning. Jesus didn't come into this world to condemn sinners. He came to save them. 
You say, where do you get that from? John 3, verse 17, right after 16. For the Father did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus knew that the greatest need in Zacchaeus' heart was a personal relationship with him. And so instead of blasting Zacchaeus, he invited himself to his house. Look, look what they said in verse 7. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He is going to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. So what, so what do you think Jesus did? So my brain, now that I can kind of think again, my brain kind of got to running Friday and Saturday. And let's suppose they're, they're there at Zacchaeus. What do you, what do you think Jesus said? When they went there to eat at Zacchaeus, you think Jesus said, hey, sit down, boy, let me give you a sermon on, on stealing. Do you think that's what he did? You, you think Jesus said, hey, let me get you some olive oil. I need to slap you on the forehead and be gone, you demon of greed. you think that's what he did? No, no, here's the thing. Was he a thief? Hello? Yes. Was he greedy? Say Yes. But the Bible says that Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house to eat with him. And I can just see them there now. But they're, they're eating my favorite food. Mediterranean hummus and baba ganoush and shawarma and pita bread. Oh, it's good. Israelis still eat that stuff today. And in the middle of that meal, laying there, because they wouldn't have had a table, they wouldn't have had chairs. They had been laid up against some pillow or cushion somewhere. And, and Jesus looks over at Zacchaeus and says, Hey, tell me about your job. What, what do you do? Tell me a little bit. And, and Zacchaeus just loses it. He breaks down and he starts telling all how he mistreated and cheated and how he'd done all these folks wrong. And I mean, he just is confessing everything right to the Lord. And when he stands up from that supper, he's a changed man. And some of you who are here this morning, you know what you're doing is wrong. And and I'm not here to point my finger and wave it, wave it, wag it at you and say, repent, you good-for-nothing, dirty, rotten sinner. And if you don't get right with God, he's going to th throw lightning bolts out of heaven and turn you into a piece of bacon. That's not what I'm here to do. What I'm here to do today is to introduce you to the same Jesus that met G Zacchaeus that day and totally changed his life. Do you need to make some changes? Absolutely. But you can't change yourself. As a matter of fact, I love what the old-timey preachers used to say. You don't clean yourself up in order to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and he does the cleaning. When Jesus Christ comes to be your friend, he's going to help you clean up your act and change what you need to change. And so he knows your name. He knows your need. Number three, he knows your potential because he doesn't just see you as you are. He sees you as what you can become. Everybody else here in Luke chapter 19 saw Zacchaeus as a wicked, evil, mean tax collector. Z Jesus saw Zacchaeus, what, what he could become. Zacchaeus, here, here's the thing. We're going to be done. I'm going to watch your faces. I love doing this all the rest of the services. Zacchaeus' name literally means pure. That's what his name means. Somebody messed up. His name means pure. That's what Jesus saw. Not a wicked, crooked tax collector who mistreated his neighbors. He saw a man who could become pure. He saw a man who could become so changed so much that where he had been greedy, now he's going to be generous and give more than half of his fortune away. And as Jesus stood at the bottom of that tree, he didn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, you're a thief. And if you'll pay back what you owe plus all the penalties and interest, then I'll go to your house and I'll eat with you. No, Jesus said, hey, come down. Let's hang out. Let me go to your house. Let's get to know each other other because once you get to know me you're going to see yourself in a different light and then you're going to want to make some changes and by the way, that way that's probably what jesus is saying to you today you've made mistakes there's sin in your life and i'm here today to lovingly point out those things and needs in your life and to let you know that i've come to seek and to save you come on let's become friends you say well why do you say friends well it's what they accused jesus of he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners and by the way, that, that, that's all of us. So, I spend a little time every day on social media, and um, mainly Facebook, a little bit of Twitter and Instagram, not TikTok, because <clears throat> I don't want the Chinese knowing where I'm at all the time. And so, uh, one of my favorite Facebook memes, you maybe you've seen it, is a little kitten standing in front of a mirror, and in the reflection is not a kitten, it's a mighty lion. Have y'all seen that meme, that picture? 
you need to start seeing yourself as God sees you. Are you a sinner? Say yes. Yeah, we all are. Do you measure up to God's standard? Say no. No, none of us do. But Jesus came to seek and save you. When, when God looks at you, he sees in you what you can become. No matter where you've been, what you've done, uh, who you are, anything, God sees in you the potential of becoming one of his children. And you can become that today if you're not. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're here this morning and you're like Zacchaeus, you're searching. And you're trying to fill that emptiness in your heart with all kinds of stuff. And what I've noticed over the years, the folks that try to fill that emptiness with all this stuff, all it does is stretch it out and make it more empty when, they're, when they don't have anything else to, to put in it. And all those things that you're trying to stuff into your life are not going to satisfy you. The only thing that's going to satisfy you is a personal relationship with Jesus. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted him, before we stand and sing, before you leave, you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. He knows your name. He knows your need. He sees your potential. 2,000 years ago, God the Father sent his son Jesus into this world. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent Jesus into this world to save you. And this morning, if you will realize that you're a sinner, because we all are, and if you will repent of your sin, that means to tell God that you're sorry for your sin, to turn from your sin, and then if you will surrender your life to him, receive him into your heart as, as your Lord and your Savior, he will come into your life, he will forgive you of your sin, cleanse you, and give you the greatest gift that you could ever receive, the gift of eternal life. And you could do that. You could experience that before you stand to your feet in just a moment.